guess who? Not Al, but John. That's right, John. Uh, he had one of those near-death experiences. Okay, you know what I'm saying? You heard about those? Must have been the chicken. That's my theory, but I digress. But anyway, so he had this near-death experience, and he's a Christian, so he's at the pearly gates, okay? And he's up there. He's waiting to get admitted, and while he's waiting, you know, St. Peter, he's leafing through the book of life there and all that stuff, and, 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 and he keeps going through the book, though, several different times, Bill, and, and St. Peter does, and he, he starts to furrow his brow, and he takes a look at John, and he says, you know, um, I can't see that you ever did anything really bad in your life, right? Yeah, whatever, it's a joke. But anyway, and, and then and I, I, I can't see, though, you've done anything really good either. Okay, if you can point to one really good deed, you're in. So John, he thinks about it for a moment. He says, uh, got one. See, there was this time, one time when I was driving down the road in Las Vegas, and I saw this giant group of thugs. They were assaulting this poor girl there. And, and so uh, I saw them, I drove up to them, and I slowed down my car, and, and, and sure enough, that's what they were doing. There was about 50 of them, man, harassing this terrified young woman. And I was so infuriated, I got out of my truck, I grabbed a tire iron, and I walked up to the leader of the gang. He was this huge guy, man, massive guy. He had this studded leather jacket on. He had a chain running from his nose all the way back up to his ear. And as I walked up to him, the, the rest of the guys, the 50 of them, made a circle around me there. And so I went right up to the leader. I ripped the chain right off his face. I smashed him over the head with the tire iron. I laid him out totally cold. Now you know why I'm nice to John, Al. But anyway, that's right, so... But, <laughs> He said, so then John says, then I turned and I yelled at the rest of them, leave this poor innocent girl alone. You're all a bunch of sick, deranged animals. You better go home before I teach you a lesson in pain. And Peter, yeah, I'm serious. He was all, he was like, whoa, man, he's impressed with John. He says, really? When did this happen? And John said, How about two minutes ago. <laughs> Near death experience, he's standing in heaven. That's right, Tom. But as you can see, sometimes the point is this, our trip to heaven could be very quick, can it not? <laughs> when you least expect it, okay? And believe it or not, folks, the Bible says that one day a whole ton of people are going to have that same quick procedure. They're going to heaven just like that, okay? And the Bible calls that the rapture of the church, okay? That's good news. But the bad news is those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they ain't going. Instead, they're going to be catapulted into the seven-year tribulation, which is mankind's worst nightmare. It is an outpouring of God's wrath on a wicked and rebellious planet. And Jesus said, it's so horrible, okay, that unless God shortened that time frame, not one person would survive on the planet. Okay, you don't want to be there. Okay, in other words, okay, but as we saw, God is not just a God of wrath. He's a God of love as well. And because he loves you and I, he's given us so many. It'd be one thing if he just gave us one. But he's given us so many signs to let us know, to give us a heads up, to be prepared before it's too late, okay? Uh, letting us know when the tribulation was coming and so was the second coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, in order to keep you and I here at sunrise from experiencing the ultimate bad day, man, of being left behind, we're gonna continue our study called the final countdown, okay? We've already dealt with the number 10 sign on the final countdown was the... Jewish people. That's right, John, you're on the ball. The Jewish people. Number nine sign was not modern technology. The number eight sign was worldwide upheaval. And the last two times was the rise of falsehood. And what we saw is God, I truly believe it's out of love because he doesn't have to give us a heads up warning. That out of love, he told us that when we see an increase across the planet, people claiming to be Jesus Christ, is that happening? Uh-huh, increase of false Christ. And false myths, people going outside the Bible for truth, uh-huh, that's happening. And last time, the false teachings, starting with the false teaching of the lie of evolution. And what we saw is Peter clearly said, this is why in the last days you're going to have a scoffing, skeptical society specifically towards God, towards his judgment, and towards his second coming. And can anybody realize that that's what's happening right now? Exactly. And so what does that tell us? Peter said, that means you're in the last days you're in that generation because you're full of a generation of scoffers but that's not all the third way we know evolution is a lie and it's going to be used to build the antichrist kingdom evolution is going to be used to justify the murder of billions of people going to make what hitler did like chump change he was an evolutionist by the way as well as an occultist okay uh, it's going to be used to justify uh, and try to explain away the rapture of the church and it's going to be used to actually get people to think who are left behind hey this is a great thing Okay, and we're going to get to that. But the third way that we know that evolution is a lie is from the evidence of a special creation. Turn to somebody and say, man, you are special. Go ahead, feels good, all right? But hey, don't take my word for it. God told us this on the very first page of the Bible. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 35. If you find Revelation, what do you do? 
Just flip it over and start all over again, okay? Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through uh, 27 is our context here. We're dealing with day 6. You got that one. Thank you very much. Cha-ching, cha-ching. But that's right. Uh, and uh, as we turn there, it's on page 1 of my Bible. If you've got large print, it might be page 19, but it is chapter 1. Okay? Uh, if you're there, there. Are page 1, possibly. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Stalled enough time, Jay. Let's go ahead and read the text, shall we? Sure, Pastor Billy. Okay, great. Uh, here it is. Uh, verse 24. Day six of creation. God's the one who did it, folks. Wasn't an accident. Okay? And God said, who said? God said, let the land produce what? Living creatures according to their kinds. Key word there. Kinds. Livestock. Creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds and the livestock according to their Kind and all, how many? All the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that was good. Now, after he made the animals, here's the next one. Then God said, let us make who? Man in our image, in our likeness. And let them do what over the animals? They're just like the animals. No, we're supposed to what? Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created who? Man, in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. And in case you're wondering, male and female, he created them. Okay? Very first page of the Bible, folks. And right there, out of the starting gates, it says that God made, after he made the animals, who did he make? He made us, mankind, right? Male and female. But not only that, notice what else did it say. He said, unlike the rest of his creation, he made mankind and mankind alone specifically in his image okay now the common sense thing is that means that uh, i'd say we're pretty special right he didn't do that with everything he just did it with us mankind we were created in his image now here's the problem the bible says we're a special creation from god what does evolution teach do they say oh yeah you guys are right you christians oh boy we were specially created in the image of a special god for a special purpose in life is that what they say no are you kidding they say we were created in the image of an ape right that's what they say. They, in fact, they say, you have no special purpose for your existence. Yay! We wonder why our world is so hopeless. You know what I mean? Gee, gee, why are kids acting like apes today? Well, maybe it's because you're teaching them they came from apes. Why is our world so ungodly? Why are people doing this? Maybe because you keep telling them there is no God. Why is the world so full of ho- hopelessness? Well, listen to the message that they're getting from we high. What are they being told? Evolution says, hey... Here it is, Al. This is what you get up every day. You are nothing, you came from nothing, and you have no future. Yeah! That doesn't motivate me. Okay, but it does instill hopelessness. Now contrast that to what we just read in the Bible. The Bible says you are special because you were created, unlike the rest of creation, in the special image of a special God who has a special purpose for your life. Now that's good news. And that's what the Bible says. But evolution, listen, not only denigrates you and I and reduces us to an animal, but shocker, it teaches the exact opposite of what God says. They don't say that God created us after the animals. They actually say we came from the animals. Now, again, the logical question is this. Let's put it to the test. Okay, it's one thing to believe this. It's one thing to teach this and promote it in our schools and in the media. But my question is, what hardcore evidence do you have to back this up? What hardcore scientific proof do you have to confidently declare that we came from an ape instead of Adam? Well, folks, believe it or not, I don't have time. I could be here for, I'm, I'm not kidding, months and expose all the lies of evolution, okay? But believe it or not, they don't have any. And what supposed proof they have is an absolute lie. Let's take a look at just a couple of mechanisms of how evolution is supposed to work, and you tell me if they're not all built on lies. That's all it is, folks. And the first lie is the live ape man, that we came from an ape. Let's take a look at some of their supposed best proof of this supposed theory. Let's take a look at the hardcore evidence. Nebraska man, that's the first lie. Okay, in 1922, scientists discovered a fossil in Nebraska that was reported to be one million years old. As we saw last week, boy, that dating method they use is so accurate. Yeah, whatever, they made it up. Okay, and it was heralded as the missing link in human evolution. And it was so uh, important to them that they used it for proof in the Scopes Monkey Trial, which is what they used for justification to get evolution eventually into our schools. So man, this must be some hardcore proof. I'm not making this up, folks. The only problem was it was actually found out, Nebraska man, to be just a mere tooth and that of a pig. 
That's all that it was, okay? Eager evolutionists, you can check it out for yourself, built a whole imaginary society and lifestyle around a single pig tooth. That's all they found. It was, it's completely made up. They built the entire Nebraska man out of plaster Paris and imagination. They even built the guy a wife. <laughs> I like what one guy, common sense response, he says, man, you gotta be pretty good to know what his wife looks like only from his tooth. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Hey, don't be laughing. Brandy's eyeballs right here. You know what I'm saying? It's really annoying because she sees everything I eat. Whatever, but it's like, how can you put a tooth? Excuse me? That's a lie. Okay, that's your, what? Okay, but that's just tip of the iceberg. How about Piltdown Man? For more than 50 years, we were led to believe that this ancient creature was another supposed ancient ancestor of modern man. And it was considered the second most important fossil, proving, that's right, proving evolution. Well, let's take a look at the facts. The only problem was it was a lie. It was a fraud. The original discoverers took a human skull and an ape's jawbone and filed them down to make them fit together. And then they treated them with acid to make them look old. They buried them in a gravel pit, came by, oh, look what we discovered. It's been proven for many decades, folks, this thing is a lie and that they still continue to promote it. How about Neanderthal man? That's even worked into our vocabulary. It was a lie. Neanderthal man is the first supposed ape man ancestor found back in Darwin's day. Okay, oh, it's gotta be true. Well, let's take a look at the facts. In 1908, a professor declared Neanderthal man, this is where we get the term, was this ignorant knuckle dragging ape like man because the low eyebrow ridges, which by the way, people alive today still have, which I don't recommend you saying they came from an ape, okay? But, uh, uh, but they also, because of a stooped over posture, Okay, that's what they, well, see, here it is, evolution, right? Well, it was discovered that Neanderthal man was just as human as you and I, and listen, his stooped over posture was caused by arthritis and rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency. Listen, folks, this is what they've done. He was bent over, not because he was slowly evolving, coming up like the pictures show, and that's all they got is pictures. <laughs> the dude was bent over because he had arthritis and he was slowly going down. That's why he had a bent over posture, complete Baloney is what they made up. Let me give you one more because this is one of the more current ones. Lucy is one of the most uh, uh, recent finds of evolution of the supposed ape man and it's almost been universally accepted without question. Well, let's take a look at some of the hardcore facts. First of all, what bones that they found were scattered and they came from completely different locations. Listen to this. This is insane, folks. The knee joint of the carcass was found a mile and a half away from the rest of the skeleton. And yet National Geographic said, no, oh, this is Lucy's knee. Excuse me? It isn't like you're digging the dirt. I found a couple of bones, okay? Okay, they just only found a few bones, period. But then you're going to say, yeah, I was walking. Mile and a half later, oh, hey, look at her kneecap. They pieced it together like a puzzle. For, oh, let's grab this. It's a lie. In fact, I like what one guy said. He says, how fast was that train going when it hit that monkey? Because that's the only way I can think of it. <laughs> the kneecap goes a mile and a half. It's a bunch of baloney, folks. Okay, that's still not all. Then they said, no, no, no. Okay, you don't like that. And they say, we know that Lucy was becoming a human due to the fact that an ape has a straight femur, but Lucy's femur is angled like a human's. <gasps> yeah, well, that part's true, but here's the problem. Although monkeys that do walk on ground, yeah, they have a straight femur, but monkeys that climb in trees, guess what they have? A uh, angle femur. And so all that showed was it as she was a tree climbing monkey as opposed to one that walked on the ground. That's not evolution. It's a bunch of baloney, okay? And then if that wasn't bad enough, St. Louis Zoo put up a display of Lucy with human feet on her, and guess how many foot bones they found? Zero. Pure propaganda. You get, that's the actual photograph. They didn't find any feet bones, but they made it look like they were human. That's all they do, folks. They just draw it up because they have no evidence. And as it turns out, Lucy's just a tree-climbing monkey. Some feel there might even be some still alive today in Vietnam. It's in Sumatra in that area. It's a lie, okay? Let me give you just a couple more examples. That's the uh, ape man. How about the lie of natural selection? Because we all know that through the process of natural selection, that's how evolution occurs, right? Wrong. I only have time for just one lie that they try to prove this theory. And the first one's called the peppered moth. Maybe you guys hide this in school because they still use it today even though it's a lie, okay? A peppered moth is uh, a, a, a species of moth that's back in England, okay? And it comes in light and dark varieties as you can see there. Okay, and here's how the story goes, and boy, is that the word a story, okay? They say that the light-colored moths started out being the dominant ones, okay, as you can see there, uh, but due to pollution, the black ones became more dominant because they were camouflaged by the black suit, okay? And so, you know, before the pollution problems, the, the white ones would appear on the trees, and then they, the birds would eat them, and so the black became dominant, and then eventually it switched, 
Okay, years later, anti-pollution laws were enforced. Then the black ones lost their camouflage again, so the birds went back to eating them again, which caused the light ones to become dominant again. Okay, you guys ever remember that in school? Okay, if they ever had there? Okay, that's the whole, uh, whole story. And again, that's the key word. It was made up by a guy named H.B. Kettlewell. And at first, his experiments seemed pretty straightforward, right? Because you don't think these people are going to lie. Okay, he even took photographs of light and dark moths resting on tree trunks during the daytime with birds eating the less camouflaged one. <gasps> well, it's got to be true. Well, and then he even described it, quote, the most striking evolutionary change ever witnessed in an organism. Or was it? Okay, let's take a look at the facts. It was another lie. First of all, after 25 years, only two moths were seen in their natural habitat. How would you guys like to have that job? After 25 years of being on the job, I only had to find two moths. <laughs> what? But still, he only found two moths, period. Then it was discovered that pepper moths don't even rest on tree trunks in the daytime like the pictures showed, okay? Instead, they're night flyers and they hide under the leaves. So he's got a problem. How's he gonna make it work? I'm not making this up, folks. To get the desired pictures, listen, Kettlewell and others trapped the moths, raised them in a laboratory, then took some dead ones and some live ones and either pinned or glued them on the trees for the photographs. It's a lie, okay? In fact, some of the live ones were so sluggish, they had to warm them up on the hood of their car just to live them up just so the birds would eat them. This has been known as a lie for a long time, and they're still using it today for proof. Of evolution okay let me give you just one more how about the live embryology okay as you can see there and with that nifty picture but we'll move on uh that started with a guy in the 1800s with a german guy oh by the way hitler based a lot of his evolutionary beliefs on this guy's work his name is ernst haeckel okay and he said that as a fertilized egg develops to form an embryo it actually repeats its supposed evolutionary history okay do you guys remember those photographs maybe you saw this in the textbooks remember that in school how they tried to brainwash you Haeckel actually examined and drew pictures of figs, of fish, frogs, chickens, pigs, and human embryos side by side. You can see there. And he says, look, see, there's a remarkable similarity between their stages of development. That means we all came from a primordial ooze because we're... D well, let's take a look at the facts. The problem is, folks, uh, all those pictures and diagrams that he used for his proof, they were fakes. And this has been known for, gosh, what, over 125 years, 150 years? Okay, as it turns out, Haeckel was an accomplished artist as well as an anatomist. And it's been proven, folks, he faked the drawings to, once again, shocker, make his appear, uh, theory look true. Okay, and believe it or not, it was exposed as a lie back in 1874. And this one, I know they still use in textbooks today as proof of evolution. Okay? In fact, folks, he was convicted of this fraud by his own university where he taught and he was charged with fraud by five professors and was considered an absolute utter disgrace for the rest of his career, but they still put in textbooks today. But here's what I love. This is very telling to me, folks. Uh, uh, Haeckel actually said this in his defense. He said, quote, other evolutionists had committed similar offenses. And how dare we question? Because we all know that evolution... It's based on hardcore scientific data, Al. Makes you wonder what else they're lying about, right? I don't know. I mean, to me, logically, I'm going, man, gee whiz. I mean, if all you got is lies to support your theory, <laughs> hey, maybe it's time you get a new theory. Anybody with me on that one? Why in the world would you deliberately lie to us? Because that's what's happening. We'll get to that in a second, okay? But that's not all. Let me give you one more example of supposed evolutionary mechanisms, and that's of the thing called sequential ordering. And that's where they have the, all these pictures, because that's all they got, pictures or animation, not proof. Okay? And what they do is they take all these bones that they find in the dirt, and they arrange them in a certain order, and that supposedly proves evolution. Right? But first of all, stop and think about that procedure. When you find a bone in the dirt, what do you know? You don't know anything about it, right? All you know is, hmm, that thing's dead. Right? You don't know if it had any kids. You don't know what kind of kids. You don't know what the kids look like. You don't know nothing. That's all you know, okay? And to show you how goofy this is, we're going to watch a guy uh, use logic and common sense to show that if you think that arranging bones in a certain order can prove evolution, you can prove the evolution of anything, including silverware. Let's take a look. Just because you can arrange animals in order doesn't prove a thing. Even if you find them buried in a certain order, that doesn't prove a thing. If I get buried on top of a hamster... Does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> I've been doing ev a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for years. 
I believe after intensive research, the knife evolved first and then slowly evolved to the spoon. It took millions of years. You know, great geological pressure squeezed it, <coughs> dished it out, widened it up a little bit. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into the short tine fork. And then very slowly, over millions of years, the grooves got longer and wider. I knew I had the right order, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between spoons and forks. You see, spoons are rounded and no grooves. Forks are squared and grooved. That's two jumps in one. Even punctuated equilibrium can't do that. So I knew I had a missing link here, folks, but I couldn't find it. Till one day I'm flying in the airplane on US Air, 30,000 feet off the ground, and the stewardess walked down the aisle and handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had. But my trained scientific eye picked it up. I said, this is it. Later that day, I went to get some chicken for lunch and found another one. There they are, folks, the missing links. So the evolution of silverware is becoming very complete. <laughs> I have found a lot of evidence since then. I've been gathering data on this for a long time. I even found a few mutants along the way. <laughs> Didn't quite make it for some reason. You know, it was very interesting, though. As soon as people found out I was doing research on the evolution of the fork, everybody wanted to become famous. They sent me all their data from all over the country. Even some lies got sent to me, folks. I mean, some people just, they just want to be famous. This one is an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. <laughs> it didn't get by me, though. This is a cutthroat business. This fossil business is dangerous, you know. You got to watch it. But I caught it right away. That didn't, it's not in my museum. The rest of them are, though. Even found that environmental pressures can cause all sorts of colors to arise over millions of years. Now, look, you can arrange letters in order and try to prove something if you want. You can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog making one letter change at a time. If you play around for a while, you can turn yourself into a fool. <laughs> wow. Hey, how many of you guys are going to be good evolutionists today when you go out to lunch and uh, take a really close look at your silverware? Okay, Because you might find that missing link. Um, I guess, Bill, it's a piece of pork on the end of your fork, but uh, that's me personally. But uh, uh, excuse me? That's, that's one of your best proofs? It, it, that, that's it? That's what your theory is based on? Folks, we have been lied to. And again, I'll say to the common sense response, if all you have is lies to support your theory, maybe it's time to get a new theory. Why in the world would you deliberately lie to us? Why would you lie to people? Why would you lie to kids? Why are you doing this? Well, folks, we saw last week the Bible gave us the answer. It's a sign that you were in that generation of the last days. Peter said in the last days, scoffers would come who would not only mock and scoff at God's existence, but of his judgment and his second coming. And he said there, they would deliberately forget the genuine proof of God's existence and make things up. Why? Because it's based on science? No, just because they can follow their ungodly desires. They don't want there to be a God. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with sin, including the lie of eight man, natural selection, embryology, and a whole host of others that I don't have time to get into. But I think you're getting the point. This is a sign, evolution on the planet. And this kind of obvious lying and scoffing is a sign we're living in the last days. Second Peter 3 predicted it for us. The th fourth way we know evolution is lie is from the evidence of a judge creation. Jesus believe that Noah and the flood was literal, not a myth. Let's take a look at that one. And this is the quote from Jesus. Once again, he's being asked in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39, uh, the logical question, right? When, when are you coming back? What's, this, what's gonna be a sign? He says, first of all, no one knows about that day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Can I translate that for you? Would you false teachers stop predicting dates and putting a mockery upon Christianity? Because you don't know, I don't care how good you are at math, including the calculator. You don't know. That's from Jesus. You're calling Jesus a liar. But here's the good news. He says, you don't know the exact day. But right after that, Jesus gives us a clue when you're getting close. And notice what that clue was. He said, as it was in the days of who? Noah. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood, God's first judgment on the world, came and took them all away. Okay, Jesus said that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? 
And folks, again, what we see, the Bible clearly says nobody knows the day nor the hour, but I really believe Jesus, out of love, gave us yet another clue as to how we know when we're getting close. And notice what it was. He talks about a literal society by a literal guy who was literally named Noah, who literally survived a judgment literally in the past, right? Now, here's the problem. Is that what evolution teaches? Do they say, yeah, yeah, there was this literal guy named Noah who literally survived on a literal ark with the animals to survive a literal judgment. We agree. No, what do they do? They mock the account of Noah, which is calling Jesus a liar, by the way, and I do not recommend, and they flat out call it a myth. And they usually come to you and I as if we're the unintelligent ones and with, with dripping, syrupy mockery that will you mean to tell me? that all the animals on the world fit on that boat, right? You ever had to encounter those discussions? That's exactly what they do. Well, first of all, hello, if you read your Bible, it's, that's, that's what you need to do if you're truly going to investigate something. You, whether you believe in the Bible or not at that point, if you're going to mock and scoff at the Bible, like I used to, you'd think you'd get in there and at least read it. I didn't do it either. It's called hypocrisy. Okay, but if you would read the Bible, you'll see that Noah didn't have to bring two of every single living thing on the planet like they want to bait you with. He only had to bring two of every kind. That's what we saw, which means you don't need to bring two of every single species of dog, variations of kind. You only need to bring two of the dog kind, a male and a female that comes in handy for what you're trying to do later repopulate the earth okay okay that would seriously reduce the number then right not two of every species just two of every kind the second thing if you read the bible you see that he only had to bring air breathing land animals not the water ones okay so you put just those two limiting factors together and that's going to seriously reduce the number but i still agree still that's a lot of animals to squish into that boat right so so let's do unlike sometimes with the evolutionists let's put it to the test Shall we? Let's not just blindly read the Bible. Let's put it to the test. Was there enough room on that ark to hold two of every kind of animals and just the air-breathing land ones? Yes, in fact, as we're going to see when you do the math, calculate it or not, uh, there was room to spare. Let's take a look at what we know about the ark from the scripture. Okay, first of all, the ark was not a ship with sloping sides. Unfortunately, they make great for nursery rooms and kids' books and stuff, but that's not good. The ark according to the dimensions, was a large barge. To give you a visual analogy, if you can't see it there, uh, it was kind of like a big giant oil tanker. It wasn't some just boat and it's boiling you know, out like this, a bulge. It was a huge, massive just barge. And people, well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't uh, you know, steer very well. <laughs> he's not going anywhere. He's just trying to float. Okay, He's just trying to survive the flood. Okay, But anyway, so it's, it's a large barge. It had a larger carrying capacity based on that factor. And so if you do the math based on the dimensions given to us in the Bible, and that is this, Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, here's what God says to Noah. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and cut it with pitch inside and out. The thing's waterproof. Okay, this is how you're to build it. Here's the exact dimensions. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high and make a roof for it and finish the ark within 18 inches to the top. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. It was a triple decker, okay? But we know the actual dimensions. We just read them. Now, let's put it to the test. If you do the math then, based on those dimensions, the ark would have had over 100,000 square feet of floor space, a total cubic volume of 1,518,000 cubic feet, which is equivalent to about 569 modern railroad stock cars. That's a big boat. A lot of room. Let's continue on. Therefore, researchers agree there's plenty enough room on the ark to hold two of every kind of air-breathing land animal, like the Bible says. In fact, there was room to spare. Okay? Researchers discovered that on the high side, no more than 35, no more than 35,000 individual animals needed to go on the ark because the average size of the animal okay, on the planet is about the size of a sheep, okay? And, uh, and even the few large ones, like the elephants or giraffes, you don't need to bring the big ones. Noah was a smart guy, I'm sure, okay? Uh, he probably figured that you don't need to bring the full-grown elephant or the full-grown giraffe. You need to bring maybe even the baby ones. Well, why? Well, that's common sense because uh, babies eat less, they sleep more, they don't move around as much, okay? And they live longer to repopulate the earth, which is why 
you bring them in the first place. Okay, so, so, so that gives you the average size then, okay, is about the size of a sheep. So, but even so, researchers decided to pad this number anyway, just to be generous. And so they decided, well, let's crank it up, 15,000 more than what we need to, round it off to 50,000, not 35, like it should be, we're going to bump it up to 50,000, okay? Now, here's what they found. Using the railroad cars for comparison, they know the average double-deck stock car can accommodate about 240 sheep, okay? So if you do the math, that means all the 50,000 animals, 15,000 more than you need, but to pad the number, can be carried on only 208 of the 569 railroad cars, which is only 37% of the space on the ark which logically then would in, uh, include th 361 cars or enough to make about five trains, each train having 72 cars, just to carry all the food, all the baggage, plus Noah's family of eight people. Hey, isn't that what you're supposed to do with science? It's supposed to be tested, tried, demonstrated, repeated? I mean, I mean that's what we just did with the biblical account, right? Looks to me, folks, like there was plenty enough room on that ark to hold the animals that God said he was going to hold, right? You had room to spare. You could do dance parties. Maybe that's what they were doing. You know, waiting around because they were in there for over a year if you read the Bible, okay? But seriously, folks, if you, when you look at the facts, there's no need to mock. There's no need to say that, well, that must be a mythical account there to teach us a moral lesson only. No, it was a literal guy and a literal account. Besides, flip it around. We just, we put it to the test scientifically, the biblical account. Have you ever stopped to think, have you ever stopped to think about what evolutionists teach? They teach, when you boil it down, folks, that we all came from a rock. You don't believe me? This guy, once again, was able to get them to admit it. Check this out. Asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. This preacher called all the colleges and universities around Boston. I got my charts out, and I said, now, folks, I believe the Bible. <clears throat> Nobody cheered. I said, I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. The world's not millions of years old. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, and I gave him the basic Bible story, okay? Then I told them what they believe. Because most of them don't know what they believe. You have to tell them. <laughs> you guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, made a hard rocky crust. It rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And this early life form found somebody to marry. <laughs> Boy, now that's a good trick. And something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. I seem to do that to them. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. I said, yes, sir, you're right about that. He said, you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off a of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? Ha, ha, ha. I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> I had one lady, I'm sorry, woman, come to me after a debate one time. She was steaming down the aisle, boy, she was mad. Oh, I could tell, I'm in trouble now. I stood there quivering in my boots, you know. She walked up and she said, Tonight, you said, we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, well, ma'am, calm down just for a minute. I said, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, uh, where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> and you could see it was slowly dawning on her. I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you do. You ought to be proud of it. Hey, don't step on Grandpa, whatever you do. <laughs> Man, I don't know about you, but... Uh... Call me a wacky Christian, but I think I'm going to stick to the account of two dogs and Noah's Ark. How about you? <laughs> Apparently, I don't have enough faith to believe we came from a rock. Oh, isn't that the irony, though? You say you can't have religion in schools, but there is no proof for evolution, and you have to believe in faith millions and billions of years ago, and yet you can teach that? That's a whole other issue there, okay? But seriously, folks, you can see there's no need to mock or scoff the literal account of Noah, okay? It's not only factual, it's a whole lot much more feasible than evolution. And here's the point. Remember, is it any surprise that they would want to undermine the Noahic account? 
No, because this is the clue that Jesus used to show us that we're living in the last days. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And if you look at the days of Noah, it was a completely, utterly depraved, continually wicked society, just like today, which means, guess what? We're living in the last days, according to Jesus, with the literal guy called Noah and his society being repeated. But that's not the fifth and final way we know evolution is a lie, is the evidence of a fearful creation, Okay. And folks, one of God's most awesome and fearful creations he ever made was called the dinosaur. Yes, God made them, folks, but don't take my word for it. Let's listen to his. Let's go back to our opening text, folks. Let's take a look at this. Where did they come from? Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 through 25. And God said, let the lamb produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals each according to its kind and it was so god made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and how many all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds and god saw that it was good now folks here's just a logical extrapolation god is the one who clearly created all the land animals right says it right there we know that part But stop and think about it. Logically, then that must mean that he also included another land animal called the dinosaur, okay? Which then means basically what we just read of the Noahic account. It must have been, therefore, the flood as to what wiped out the dinosaurs, right? Because it wiped out all the air-breathing land animals that didn't go on the ark. And so, therefore, that must be what killed them, right? According to the Bible. But here's the problem. Is that what evolution teaches? Oh yeah, God's the one who's responsible for dinosaurs. And yes, they were wiped out by a worldwide flood. We need to wake up and learn that lesson. No, what do they say? They say all the dinosaurs and everything else came from a rock. And the dinosaurs died out 70 million years ago. Now again, to be fair, hey, it's one thing to believe that. One thing to teach that. But my question is, what hardcore scientific data do you have to back that up? And listen, specifically, what proof do you have that it wasn't a flood that took them out? Well, believe it or not, shocker, folks, they don't have any proof. In fact, when you look at the proof, it proves they were taken out by a flood. When you look at the actual remains, it had to have been a flood. First of all, uh, they not only find tons and tons of dead things around the world, but they find so many of them, they give them a name, and they call them fossil graveyards. You would think that if there was a literal worldwide flood on the planet that destroyed everything that wasn't in that ark, okay, the animals there, that we would find billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the world, Right? But gee, guess what we find? Billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the world. There's so many of them jam-packed together. It was massive destruction. They call them fossil graveyards. And they not only contain tons and tons of fossils, but they find them all jumbled up, thrown together in a completely disordered mass, exactly like you'd find in a sudden violent worldwide flood okay in fact the pictures of the dinosaur graveyards often show people chiseling out the backbone of an animal that has no legs a head or tail or rib cage attached to it it's got no teeth marks on the bone which means they weren't scavenged it's literally just parts and pieces and pieces and parts of okay Uh, next to it's another backbone of an animal it's all bent up and twisted and, and it shows us they were not torn apart by scavengers rather they are the remains of a swirling mass of rotting animal parts that were deposited at the flood in fact they know it here's some direct quotes from them folks listen to the verbiage that they use to describe the evidence we have a huge mass grave where dinosaur fossils are jumbled together like flotsam after a flood Ah, that's interesting. Another guy said this. Uh, he said, at this spot in Wyoming, the fossil hunters found a veritable mine of dinosaur bones. The consecration was so Im- remarkable, they were piled in like logs in a jam. Just kind of like flood stuff again. That's very interesting. And folks, believe it or not, even with all this clear-cut evidence, it was a worldwide flood that wiped out the dinosaurs, just like the Bible says so. Evolutionists will once again fulfill 2 Peter 3 and deliberately forget the evidence that it was, and they will come up with anything. I call these the anything goes theories, okay? And it's anything but what God says. And they're making them up. Okay, for instance, here's some of their theories. And by the way, as I go through these, there's a ton of them, and this isn't all of them. But notice, even in their own camp, they don't even agree. At least we stick to one account, right? But let's take a look at some of their theories. They said, no, 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 it wasn't a flood. The sun became either too hot or too cold for the dinosaurs. Okay, really? Okay. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't that. Uh, The world's climate became either too dry or too wet for the dinosaurs. That's what it was. No, 
No, no, no, no, that wasn't it. Uh, uh, the supernova exploded nearby, spraying the earth with the radiation. It wasn't a flood, that's what it was. No, 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 here's what it is. A, a passing comet poisoned the earth with chemicals. That's what took out the dinosaurs, that's what. No, no, that wasn't it. Uh, the earth's magnetic field reversed and the incoming radiation killed them. That's what it was, it hadn't have been that, Junior. No, no, that's not what it was. An asteroid plunged into the earth and that's what destroyed them. We all know that, they show the animation with that. That's all they have. You know, the, uh, the, it's called the Chicxulub Crater. I don't have time to go into that. You know, supposedly proof that that's where the crater smashed. When they went down there searching for oil, they did the deposits. They've proven that that was not caused by an asteroid. It's just a natural depression in the Earth's mantle there. It has nothing to do with the asteroid. Been lied to. Shocker. Okay? But still, even with all those supposed theories, stop and think about it. If this were true, then why did this asteroid, why did this comet, why did this radiation, temperature variance, whatever it is, why did it only kill the dinosaur? You ever thought about that? Why did other animals survive? Well, we know why other animals survived because that's not how it happened. It happened with the flood and only the ones that were on the ark got to repopulate the earth. That's why. But if all these other global events took place, why just the dinosaur? Did, did they just, we have comments in the universe, I hate dinosaurs. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to wipe them all out. I'll leave everything else. I'm a generous guy. <laughs> it's crazy, folks. Let's take a look at a couple more. They said, no, no, no. Mammals ate the dinosaur eggs. That's what caused it. Those blasted mammals, I tell you what. But that's what, no, no, no. Uh, dinosaurs turned into birds and flew away. <laughs> that's one of their popular ones today. It's, it's a bunch of baloney too, but that's what they, I, I won't believe in a worldwide flood, but I will deliberately forget and say they turned into birds. <laughs> Second Peter 3, all over again, folks, is another one. Uh, new narcotic, uh, narcotic plants evolves. Literally, drugs killed the dinosaurs. Now listen, we've seen that they, their proof is all made in animation or pictures. So I want to share with you guys, according to evolution, Al, I found out what killed the dinosaurs. It was. It was drugs that killed them. Right here. <laughs> now we know smoking has caused dangerous to your health. But apparently it's being repeated today, folks, that smoking... Hey, listen, if you can make up stories, I can make them up too. Let's be fair, fair and reasonable. That's right, oh, but that's not all they said. No, 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 the inability of dinosaurs to experience slow wave sleep, sleep deprivation killed the dinosaurs. Not a flood, but I'll come up with a theory and get my grant, by the way. Uh, uh, anyway, so let's continue on. They said, no, they were killed by volcanoes, those nasty volcanoes. But again, why just dinosaurs and not everything else? Uh, uh, they said, no, it was poisonous gases. That's what's got them. No, 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 it wasn't a flood. It was parasites. They itched themselves to death. <laughs> really? You're, you're gonna believe, really? Oh, that's not, no, no, slip discs. That's what it was. I'm not making this up. These are actual theories. Oh, my bird. And that's what killed the dinosaurs. Not a flood. No, no, no. It was mass suicide. They all got together. Hey, cults happened, unfortunately. So there was the dinosaur cult back in the early days. It wasn't now. It was millions of years ago. You have to believe me on this. And they all got together and had an email, and they all decided, yep, here's the day. We're all going to kill ourselves. You'll believe that. You'll, what's the verbiage in the Bible? Deliberately forget about God's judgment. But you'll believe that. And oh, this is my favorite one. I'm not making this up. They say, no, it wasn't a worldwide flood that killed the dinosaurs. It was constipation. <laughs> constipation, that's what it did it, folks. I mean, why, why jest? Hello, this is science, don't you know? And then one guy finally said, no, it was shrinking brain. The dinosaurs got really dumb and just died out. That's what it was, instead of a flood. I like what one guy said, and folks, I think this is based on evidence. Uh, speaking of that comment, he says, quote, it is obvious that the evolutionists don't know what happened and are grasping at straws. But you know what? I'm going to take that a little bit further. I think they do know what happens, and they don't want to admit that it was a flood, and they're fulfilling Bible prophecy, whether they realize it or not, that in the last days, people are going to deliberately forget the hardcore evidence, and they're going to come out with whacked out stories just so they can continue to follow their ungodly desires, including back problems and constipation and parasites. And the Bible says when you see these things, the last days, these scoffers coming, mocking at God's first judgment, mocking at God's existence, and mocking his second coming, you better wake up. You're living in the last days. Did you ever think of this? Evolution, the teaching and promotion of evolution today is a sign, according to the Bible, we're living in the last days. And that's why Jesus said this, folks. We've seen it before. How many times? He said, because of this, folks, when these things happen, Luke 21, 28, when these things begin to take place, stand up. You better lift up your heads because, Christian, your redemption draws near. Okay? We are headed, folks, for the final countdown. Okay? And so the point is this. I beg you today, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I beg you, just like Noah must have done with the people of his day, would you please stop being a scoffer? 
and instead take God up on his offer to come into the ark of safety, Jesus Christ, also made of wood, today. You've been lied to. We've all been lied to. But now we know why. Please, come into the ark of Jesus Christ today. But if you're here today and you're a Christian, I challenge you. When Jesus returns, are there going to be any faithful Noahs alive in our generation? In the church today, are, are there any people like Noah who will care enough to look beyond our noses and see the desperate need of the people around us to get saved before it's too late? Like this guy shares. We'll close in prayer after this. Let's take a look. The stock market plummeted to record lows yesterday based on speculation. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. The Lord saw that man's wickedness had become great, and that the thoughts of his heart dwelled only on evil. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence, for the people had corrupted their ways. The Lord regretted that he had made man, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe my creation from the face of the earth men and animals, creatures that crawl on the ground and birds of the air, for I'm grieved that I have made them. But one man found favor in the eyes of the Lord, one righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, who walked with God. This is the story of Noah. Every human impulse from Adam and Eve to Noah to Solomon to each one of us has been about grabbing everything we can get. We want riches and we want fame and we want glory and we want it now. We're humans and so we're bent towards evil and selfishness and violence. The path of Christ is radically different. He starts washing feet, caring for the hopeless and ultimately through his sacrificial death he changes everything. Our motives begin to shift. We actually begin to lay down our own self-interest to pursue something much bigger than ourselves, and we actually begin to see a world in tremendous need. The reality of this world is that God is just and the world is unjust. And the Creator from Adam to Noah to now is still scouring the earth looking for one man or one woman that can actually see past their own nose to see a world that's in desperate need and do something about it. Well hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. The Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one, says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay, that's called lying. Okay, 
And if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay? The, the, another commandment says you shall not steal. Okay? Uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right. And it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly, the Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says if you even look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. And finally, the Bible says uh, you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? Well, again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder. The only difference is you pulled the trigger, if you will, in your heart. You wish they were dead. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing in principle. Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. And that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. E for instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime. Uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel, and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, they certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime. Okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you for your sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember... I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156.
For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.